All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Good afternoon. My name is Sean Riley. I'm Senior Director for Programs here at the American Conservative. I'm pleased to invite you to this discussion of our fascinating and provocative uh, um, March-April cover story with this author, Ted Galen Carpenter. Before we get started, I want to take a quick moment and encourage you to become a member of the American Conservative if you aren't one already. In addition to the print magazine, uh, membership, the which uh, this, here we have the, the print, the, the current uh, issue of the print magazine. Uh, in addition to that print magazine, the membership comes with a number of other benefits, including an ad-free experience and the ability to comment on our website, www.theamericanconservative.com, as well as a, a stake in our growing movement of Main Street Conservatives. Memberships start at just $5 a month. You can view the options on our website at theamericanconservative.com slash uh, subscribe. So I hope you'll join us. Uh, here to guide our conversation, I'm ple pleased to introduce our senior editor, Sumantra Maitra. In addition to his work with us, Dr. Maitra is also a senior fellow at the Center for Renewing America, an elected associate fellow at the Royal Historical Society UK, and a senior contributor uh, uh, to The Federalist. He holds a PhD in international relations and strategy from the University of Nottingham, UK. Uh, after the discussion, we'll take a few minutes um, to take some questions from the audience. So uh, as we go along, you can feel free to submit those in the question, the Q&A box there at the bottom of your screen, and we will take them up uh, toward the end. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Mantra to introduce Dr. Carpenter. Thank you, Dr. Riley. Um... <clears throat> It is uh, an honor to introduce Ted Galen Carpenter, who obviously needs no introduction. He is the contributing editor to the American Conservative, a senior fellow for defense and foreign policy studies at the Cato Institute. Uh, Dr. Carpenter served as Cato's director of foreign policy studies from 1986 to 1995, and as vice president for defense and foreign policy studies from 1995 to 2011. Uh, he's also a contributing editor at the National Interest, incidentally, which was my earlier joint, and the author of 13 books. He holds a PhD in U.S. diplomatic history from the University of Texas. Please welcome Dr. Carpenter. Um, incidentally, Ted, I would like to mention that I was actually reading your 2007 policy brief on Taiwan with uh, Justin Logan uh, on where you mentioned why we can't make the Taiwanese uh, spend more money on the defense, but that's a uh, that's a conversation for uh, another day. Another day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, about your extremely interesting, provocative, and ultimately convincing um, cover story for our magazine. Uh, for those who have read, they have a basic idea, but for those who have not, um, I think it would be best if we start the conversation by me asking you, could you kindly uh, explain to the audience the central thesis of your argument on why you compare Ukraine to the Confederates and what are the kind of structural disadvantages in your opinion they're facing and which can be uh, increasing in the coming days. I make the point early on in the article that uh, no two historical periods, no two historical episodes are ever uh, identical. There are always gonna be some major differences. And there is no, this case is no exception. However, there are some intriguing similarities between the Russia-Ukraine war and the civil war in the United States. And one of the similarities is that the underdog, the Confederacy and Ukraine did surprisingly well during the initial period of the conflict. Um, in the case of the US Civil War, even two years into the conflict, the Confederate forces were doing extremely well because of better military leadership primarily. Uh, but as time went on, as the war became a grinding war of attrition over a period of years, the North's advantages in population, in industrial capacity, uh, eventually overwhelmed the Confederacy. And that absent massive outside help, that result was inevitable. The 
Ukrainians, I think, face a similar situation right now. That if you look at Russia's greater population, we're talking a uh, population more than triple that of Ukraine's, and you look at the size of the Russian military compared to Ukraine's, and it is reminiscent of the kind of advantage that the North had that eventually proved overwhelming. Now, whether history follows the same pattern in this case, we don't know. There are two big differences that I point out. Uh, one is that Abraham Lincoln eventually founds very competent generals with Grant, with Sherman, with Sheridan, and others. Uh, Russia has yet to find, I think, even a semi-competent general. And unless that changes, that certainly inhibits the Russian war effort. The other big difference is the extent of outside assistance. Uh, Britain and France blow, both flirted with aiding the Confederacy, but for a variety of reasons, they stayed back. Uh, that certainly has not been the case with NATO and Ukraine. NATO is pouring weapons into the country. It's sharing military intelligence with Kiev, which I would think the Russians have to regard as extremely provocative. And so that kind of assistance has kept Ukraine in the fight. How much longer it could do that without direct NATO military intervention is doubtful, however. So it's quite a lot of point that you raised there, but I'm going to focus on uh, a couple of them. But before that, I'm going to give some numbers to those who don't know. Uh, so far, uh, you know, you mentioned about the Russian population density is like three times um, more than Ukraine. Um, they have done two phases, correct me if I'm wrong, of partial mobilization. They haven't done any kind of total mobilization yet. Um, their economy is obviously higher than Ukraine. They have lost we don't really know how many Ukraine casualty numbers are. That's kind of like hidden in the news uh, media that we see these days. But Indeed. a calculated guess would be around similar, um, which would affect Ukraine more than Russia. And uh, there has been around 8 million people drained away from Ukraine because they have been refugees and they fled to Europe and America. Um, the, the point that you raised here is, one, uh, in a war of attrition, uh, the more the war goes on, it favors Russia. Now, do we know for certain that the Russians are either socially or culturally or demographically or militarily capable of continuing this war of attrition beyond two to three years? I mean, what are the calculations that they might be making, for example, because I don't see Putin at least trying to kind of like stir the pot and having a full mobilization, which might uh, affect his own regime in some ways. And the second point is the more important point is Russians are not the union uh, of the United States army. You know, they, they are their Their military doctrine is they've got ne nepotism inside. They're not really that competent. Like we have seen Sirobikin, who was like a really good general, kind of demoted who because he favored more defensive line and then Gerasimov kind of like put forward because he had he he's just close to Putin. So how does that affect uh, Russian power or dynamic in this equation, do you think? If uh, the United States and NATO had uh, kept to the supposed original objective, just helping Ukraine defend itself, I think uh, discontent within Russia, given the slow pace of the war, uh, given the obviously disappointing outcome so far, uh, Putin and his inner circle could be under considerable pressure to reach a peace accord. However, the United States and NATO escalated the stakes to the point of wanting to inflict a decisive defeat on Russia, so much so that Russia could not pose a threat to any other country. And increasingly, there is the flirtation with forcible regime change. They want Putin out. Well, that poses an overwhelming threat to Putin and his inner circle. It also poses a, a real threat to Russia as a nation. This is now arguably from their standpoint, 
become a war of survival, that Russia would be at best a puppet of the United States and NATO if they lose, and at worst, uh, the complete unraveling of the Russian Federation. So I think uh, unless the situation turns much, much worse for Russia, they're likely to stay the course despite the suffering, despite the losses. Now, General Mark Milley, uh, the chairman of the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, I think inadvertently uh, made a comment last uh, November that both sides had suffered something in excess of 100,000 casualties in the war. And if that's true, if those casualty numbers on the, the two sides are, are about equal, Ukraine suffers much, much more. Uh, since then, the estimates on the Russian casualties keep going higher, now around 200,000. And the estimates about Ukrainian casualties have disappeared from any U.S. accounts, from any U.S. media accounts. So it's hard to measure. But my guess is, even if more Russians have died or been wounded, the Ukrainians are suffering a lot. And uh, the longer this goes on, the more and more they will suffer. So in the in the Civil War, there were situations where the, the South kind of like wanted to to win the war short because they knew that, mm. you know, if it goes on for, you know, they, they suffer from a disadvantage uh, when it comes to material and manpower. Um, we have seen recently calls within Ukraine and parts of NATO, not everyone, but parts of NATO about pushing to Crimea, uh, opening a southern axis, knowing very well that Ukraine probably, I mean, military doctrine tells you that, you know, the offensive operations takes usually three times more people than defensive operations. Um, the same kind of bloodbath Russians faced when they tried to come west, uh, the similar kind of bloodbath one can imagine the Ukrainians would face if they tried to move east. Um, do you think that's a viable option for Ukraine to do, given our material supply to them, which is, it seems to be unconditional now at this point of time? And if not, what is, uh, what is the Ukrainian theory of victory in this case? In terms of uh, Ukraine being able to take back Crimea without direct NATO intervention, I believe that is, that's a non-starter. It's also dangerously reckless because Russia's main naval base at Sevastopol is in Crimea. And so an attack on Crimea would be viewed by Russian leaders as a major, major threat to its principal naval base and not just on the Black Sea, its principal naval base, period. So that is... I suspect, considered an existential threat to Russia. This is not just a, another front in the Ukraine war and wouldn't be viewed as such. Um, in addition, as far as an achievable Ukrainian objective in this war, essentially, uh, it probably is a stalemate, uh, a Korea-style armistice that ends the fighting, conceivably some Russian withdrawal from uh, the Donbass region. Russia is not going to give back Crimea, I don't think under any circumstances. And probably there has to be some provision for Ukrainian neutrality, that it cannot now or ever become a member of NATO. Without those kinds of provisions, I don't see a settlement to the Ukraine war unless the Ukrainian forces are truly uh, monumentally successful. And that seems improbable over the long term. You mentioned about competence in general military discipline between the two sides. I, I would like to know whether you see any evidence that the Ukrainians are actually more competent because they're their fighting doctrines are kind of similar to the Russians and they, they have better equipments and better, you know, material coming from our side. But like, do you see that they are more competent in this situation? Like how, what, what is 
moral wise, of course, it's understandable their homeland is under attack, but what about actual fighting prowess? Well, being more competent uh, than the Russian military has uh, proven to be a pretty low bar to clear. Uh, the fact that the war stuttered out with a 16 mile long traffic jam of tanks leading from the Russian border to the Ukrainian capital was definitely not a good start. It was obviously not what the Kremlin wanted. Um, beyond that, I think Ukraine's success to this point has been heavily dependent upon the intelligence info given by the United States and probably some other NATO powers. In fact, there have been reports that uh, the U.S. is virtually running Ukraine's intelligence operations with respect to the war. And certainly some of the, the attacks have been so sophisticated that suspicions arise that Ukraine was not totally in charge of those operations. And again, how much that can be sustained? Uh, will the United States increase its participation uh, beyond the current levels? Those are all very interesting and important questions. But right now, um, Ukraine is likely at its high point in terms of its success, kind of where the Confederates were after the battles of Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville. And now would be the time for them to try to get a tolerable peace accord. It's not going to be one they like, but at least it might be bearable. So before I move on to my next question, this is for the audience who are already listening. There is a question and answer box, as you can ask. You can ask questions there, and we're going to take it forward. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to curate the questions and ask uh, Dr. Carpenter. Um, anyway, so news is always local right so at one point of time any questions about ukraine kind of like comes back to our foreign policy and how that is being affected um and i raised the question because like i mentioned before uh, before we started talking one of the prime differences between the civil war as you mentioned and the war that's happening now is on the scale, the scope, and the depth of foreign interference. Um, you absolutely rightly, in my opinion, mentioned that US is running the show, not just US, NATO. I, I, wouldn't like, I don't want to single out uh, a country, but yes, we are, if not in law, but at least in act, a co-belligerent um, in, this, in this conflict. We are providing them with coordinations and data and you know, as the saying goes, like, you know, Russian warships are not sinking themselves. Um, you know, the, <laughs> the Ukrainians are not capable of, of targeting a running ship. Um, they never had that kind of, you know, sophisticated operations done before. So obviously everyone knows that we are partly, you know, uh, providing the necessary things needed for this conflict. Now, two questions that... Um, and, and I'm probably playing the devil's advocate. You mentioned that Russians have a structural advantage and they want to kind of like stretch the war and come at a stalemate because they understand as well that Ukrainians don't have that advantage vis-a-vis -vis them. But do they not think that so far uh, Europe, NATO and the US has shown no sign of stopping any kind of aid going towards the Russians? And the second question, which automatically comes from that, is we know that China is considering sending weapons to Russia. It is very easy for the Chinese to cross train from them to Mongolia to Russia. We wouldn't be able to do anything about it. It's, and they, can, they have a manufacturing advantage over the West um, at least three times to one. So how do you think that would um, affect the dynamic and the calculations of the of the prime belligerents in this case. Like we cannot compete if the Chinese starts manufacturing weapons and sending cheap to Russia. It's a it's a, it's a very different game. Secretary of State Blinken uh, said when the reports first circulated that 
uh, China was thinking about sending arms aid to Russia. He warned that that would be a game changer in the bilateral relationship between Beijing and Washington. And he's absolutely right. However, it would also be a game changer in the Ukraine war, because you're correct. If China put its industrial capacity behind the Russian war effort, uh, NATO would be stretched to the breaking point in trying to counteract that. Uh, beyond that, I think the Chinese, this was a warning sign from them, letting these reports leak that they were considering giving arms aid to Russia. Again, when the NATO objective escalated beyond the point of just helping Ukraine defend itself to taking out Russia as a significant great power, that in some ways poses a threat to China. From Beijing's perspective, the idea of Russia being eliminated as another player in the international system uh, would give the US an overwhelming edge that would be threatening to China. So they have every incentive to at least keep Russia viable, to keep Russia as uh, a credible great power and keep them actively involved in the war rather than having to sue for peace. So this, this is a very important development. In addition, NATO has remained reasonably united, but I get the sense that it is a unity that is about 10 miles wide and about one inch thick. Uh, there are cracks already beginning to be visible in the NATO, uh, the NATO front, where there are members who are not happy about the escalation of this war and the escalation of U.S. objectives or U.S.-U.K. objectives, which I think may be more accurate. So I would expect that the level of uh, NATO unity is going to begin to decrease a bit. In addition, public opinion surveys in the United States show a modest but still significant decline in public support for Washington's policy of aiding Ukraine. That has to be taken into consideration as well. We already have give, given <clears throat> north of $117 billion of aid, and that's not just committed, like the Germans used to say, like the Germans constantly talk about, oh, they have committed $100 billion, which is not exactly like, you know, spending it. Um, but we have given $170 billion, which is, um, almost what, like double the entire defense budget of Russia. Um, the point that you mentioned about cracks in NATO, which brings me to my next question, is um, what do you think, what do you perceive to be the various blocks which are inside NATO? We know kind of like similar to the, the French and the Germans are more restrained in this case. Mm -hmm. Hungary is obviously very pro-Russian. Um, uh, Austria is very pro-Russian, although they're not really part of NATO, but they, you know, they have a major say in European politics. Uh, the Baltics, on the other hand, and the Polish are extremely antagonistic to Russia. And the British are, from a cynical perspective, doing exactly what they've been doing for the last 500 years. It's like fomenting some kind of crisis in eastern parts of Europe so that, you know, the European power, you know, <laughs> goes down and the Americans are, you know, sticking in. So, um, so what do you think is the calculation that's going on inside Europe and how that might affect European politics uh, in, in the coming days? Like, do, do, do we see, uh, how, how will this split happen if we have to sit in a, in a war room and kind of like do a tabletop simulation on how in the next one year, uh, what kind of cracks do we, do we see? Where do we see ourselves? I think you described the, uh, the various blocks pretty well. Uh, you have the shrill um, war hawks in Poland and the Baltic republics, uh, to some extent in Romania as well. The British, uh, again, you're correct, opportunistic, but in Washington's camp, uh, as London usually is. France and Germany, hoping that this can be dampened 
and that there is a a peace accord somewhere around the around the bend. Uh, the countries I would watch the most, uh, Turkey, which has almost from the beginning placed itself more in the role of mediator rather than staunch advocate of NATO support for Ukraine, and Hungary uh, becoming ever more discontented about NATO policy and the adverse effects that uh, this war is having on the welfare of the uh, Central and Western European states. The country I would watch the most going forward would be Italy. Uh, that in many ways is kind of the swing power, the, uh, the player that has been on board despite Georgia Maloney becoming uh, prime minister, uh, but basically on board with NATO's strategy of aiding Ukraine, but you sense the support is soft and good many uh, players in her party and her governing coalition are not happy about the, a confrontational policy toward Russia. And if Italy swings toward the position of Hungary and Turkey, NATO has a ma major split on its hands. Yeah, I think, I mean, you mentioned Meloni, like no one was expecting her to turn out to be Nikki Haley in, in, in Italy. Um, you know, it's, 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 it was kind of surprising, but I think, I think you're right. Like from, from what I've been hearing, like she doesn't really have much of a leverage because of her coalition politics. Like she doesn't, she's not like Orban. Like she has got no singular capacity of changing the direction of Italian politics. So I think that might be a bit of a bit of an issue. Uh, before I move on to, we are already getting questions. Uh, before I move on to that, I've got two uh, major questions for you. Um, one, who's the... So in international relations, you know, uh, a constant debate is whether it's the great power who's influencing the satellites and the protectorates or it's uh, the satellites who are chain ganging the, the great power to a conflict. What do you think is the is the equation in this situation? Like, do we do we think like the Baltics and Poland and Ukraine are the ones who are the driving this conflict? Um, contrary to the constant leaks coming out of the of the USG or or you know France and Germany, or do we think like, yeah, at the end of the day, we are the ones who are pushing for this conflict? Within the. Uh... U.S. foreign policy, defense policy establishment, there are divisions as well. The United States is not necessarily united. Um, I just lost the picture, by the way. Oh, did you? Yeah. Um, sorry, I don't know. It's, it's, I, I can see you completely um, normally. Okay, uh, that's fine as long as we can go ahead on that basis. You have elements within the U.S. Uh, national security establishment that are pushing for a very hard line, trying to take Russia out as a peer competitor to the United States militarily and politically. Um, they are very sympathetic to the view of the of the Poles, the Balts, and and other hardliners in Eastern Europe. On the other hand, you have somewhat more cautious elements that are a little worried about the desire of the East Europeans for a confrontation with Russia, one that could turn quite, quite deadly. Um, I think we have to be careful of not letting the tail wag the American dog Eastern European tail wagging American dog. In some ways, I worry about those members and their desires and behaviors in the same way that Tsarist Russia should have worried about Serbia and its agenda. So there are divisions on, on various layers of the NATO response to the war in Ukraine. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I, I tend to agree with you. Like I, I fall on the side of the, of the, of the smaller satellites dragging the power to war. I think that's a, that's my more cynical uh, outlook about this 
situation anyway. So I would like to go to the questions. Uh, we have two major questions uh, that I'm going to one by one lay in front of you. So the first question is uh, by Paul Kutsera. I hope I'm pronouncing the surname right. Um, the question is, how can you say that Ukraine is at the high watermark of military success when both sides, both in emphasis, are gearing up new military resources for a spring offensive? No one is going to negotiate until both parties see the result of this well-organized, uh, well-recognized spring offensive. So how do you think, why do you think, like what's your opinion that Ukraine is currently as we are standing uh, at a high watermark of military success? Um, primarily because Russia has had several months to build up its strength for its own offensive. Uh, secondly, Bakhmut is uh, nearly surrounded, likely to have to surrender within a very short period of time. And the Ukrainian government has urged all residents of Kherson to evacuate. That's not something you do if you're winning at this point in the war. So I, I get the definite impression that Ukraine's fortunes are beginning to wane. The fact that US officials have been dropping hints in the media that Ukraine ought to commence negotiations. Uh, that's also an indication that the assessment within the US intelligence community is that Ukraine is not going to be able to uh, advance much farther than it has at this point, and in fact is likely to lose territory going forward. Yeah, and I would also like to add uh, to your answer to this question uh, that given that the Russian war aims were conquering Kiev and doing a regime change, I think stopping that kind of tentatively mean that Ukraine did well, like on, on a relative spectrum, I think. I mean, that doesn't mean that they're gonna continue on that. And especially given that Ukrainian war aims continue to shift because we are the ones constantly providing them everything that they need without any kind of leverage. Um, the second question is by Edward Lozansky. Um, the question is, starting with Gorbachev, all Russian leaders, including Putin, kept offering US a strategic partnership or even an alliance, but Washington was not interested and moreover, kept pushing Ukraine into NATO instead of agreeing to its neutrality status. Isn't the US at least partially responsible for the current crisis? That's a long answer. <laughs> yes, I've written extensively on this that uh, the decision to expand NATO eastward was inevitably going to poison relations with Russia. I was writing that back in the mid 1990s before even the first phase of NATO expansion had become a formal proposal. Uh, I escalated those warnings when George W. Bush sought to bring Ukraine into NATO. Uh, Vladimir Putin's government made it very clear, even at that early point, that Ukraine becoming a NATO military asset, and that doesn't mean just the NATO membership card, but becoming an arena for the deployment of NATO forces, joint uh, military exercises with NATO uh, forces, all of that, Ukraine becoming a NATO military asset was crossing a bright red line. That would not be tolerated. And US officials and their cheerleaders in the news media just scorned those warnings. They were a bluff. That wasn't serious. Putin was not going to use force against Ukraine and risk a confrontation with NATO. Well, those people were spectacularly wrong. And many of them, by the way, are now equally certain that Russia will not escalate. It will never go to the point of a direct military confrontation with NATO, much less the use of tactical nuclear weapons. And one has to ask these people who are so confident that even though they were wrong before, this time they're right. How much are they willing to bet? Because they're betting the lives of themselves, their loved ones, everyone they know on their assumption being right. <laughs>
and given their track record, they ought to have greater humility. The United States and NATO contributed greatly to the onset of the current crisis. That doesn't justify Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but it does explain that it was not an unprovoked attack and that Western actions, clumsy or deliberate, contributed to the current crisis. Yeah, and also uh, that, that actually brings me to ask you one question, which I wanted to ask. Um, there has been what, like four phases when we have seen NATO expansion happening and um, uh, the Russian reactions varied in, in different phases. Like they, it, it, was, it was pretty much related to their sense of geographic proximity and uh, you know, like the you know, when when NATO went to Hungary and Poland, for example, you know, there were not much uh, coming out from Russians. In fact, uh, in 1999, as this uh, gentleman asked, Putin actually came and you know supported uh, the United States. Sorry, post 2001, because from his opinion, you know, we would be a partner in in a fight against Islamism in in Chechnya, which he was trying to kind of like. Uh, tar as an Islamist ideology, or it was more like a nationalist movement anyway. Um, my question to you is, do you think that any form of NATO expansion is a threat to Russia or it's related to some kind of cultural context when it comes to Ukraine and Georgia and not say, for example, Sweden or Finland or Montenegro <laughs> and that kind of stuff? So, I mean, foreign policy is obviously not monocausal, but like, what is your opinion? Like the Russians think more about why is Ukraine so important compared to Macedonia? Both the cultural ties and the security implications. Ukraine is not just within a Russian sphere of influence as seen from Moscow. It is in Russia's core security zone. So yes, uh, Russian leaders are going to react in a much more uh, agitated, hostile manner to that kind of NATO expansion than the earlier phases, even though those were deemed unfriendly and provocative. But this was at an entirely different level because of primarily the security factors, but also the, the cultural links, which Russians deemed important. Um, it'd be much the same the, that the United States would react differently to, let's say, a Chinese-led alliance uh, taking in Nicaragua, as opposed to a Chinese-led alliance taking in Canada or Mexico. It's just, it's at a, a different level of severity. But they didn't like the earlier stages of NATO expansion. They felt it was unfriendly, and it was. It seemed to be a manifestation of continuing suspicion of Russia, not that uh, Russia was now a partner in the post-Cold War era, but still was at best on probation. And you're right. I mean, in terms of uh, wanting to confront Islamic extremists, uh, Putin definitely held out that offer. And he gave, he used his influence to give the United States easy access for its military operations in Afghanistan. He certainly didn't have to do that. He could have used his influence to urge the Central Asian countries to resist that kind of penetration by the United States. He didn't do that. Do you think Putin has changed? himself like on a on a on a more paranoid you know psychological basis like he's he's far more you know he, he's he's a very different guy than what he used to be in, in 1998 for example that's always very hard to read i'm i'm not an expert in psychology i will say that he has become ever more hard line uh now that could have been a case where he was putting on a liberal facade when he was serving as prime minister in uh, Boris Yeltsin's government and in the years immediately following. And now the true Putin has come out. But 
it seems to me more probable that even though he had definite authoritarian tendencies, the kind of pressure that Russia has been put under has caused him to really harden his attitudes toward the West. He no longer trusts the West at all. And I don't think that was true a decade and a half ago, much less two decades ago. Bringing back the question to Ukraine, um, at one point of time, Ukraine would realize that we are not going to keep writing them blank checks. You know, their fundamental idea of victory, theory of victory is different than ours. Their war aims are different than ours. And we are essentially using Ukraine to bleed Russia dry while bleeding Ukraine dry too. Do you think there will be some kind of social backlash in Ukraine against the current Ukrainian government or the West, you know, the kind of stuff that we have seen in Afghanistan, for example, like they were, you know, we were using them to call the Soviets. And, you know, once that went away, they turned on us. Like, do you, do you, um, we have no understanding of where the weapons are going in Ukraine. There is no audit, no matter how many times Matt Gates tries to do that. Um, like what, what might be the reaction when inevitably the penny drops? It's a, a very good question, and it's extremely hard to predict. Uh, Zelensky has managed to achieve, I think, a popular mantle as the defender of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. If that effort fails, if he has to accept a uh, less than optimal peace accord is an understatement, um, he may find that there is a popular backlash. Uh, there may be greater realization that some elements of the US national security establishment uh, are perfectly willing to fight this war to the last Ukrainian. And once the war is over or the war reaches the point where Ukrainian defeat looks inevitable, you may see a backlash against the United States. These are very volatile situations, very hard to predict. Sorry, I was muted. Um, I ask you one question that just came. Um, uh, Andrew Danieri uh, is asking um, that he's still not sold, that it's the high watermark for Ukraine. I think that's a, that's a, that's a question that you're getting quite a few times. Uh, you, you probably have to explain that one more time in a, in a more uh, uh, structured way um, for those who missed. Um, the fundamental question here is like, why would you encourage uh, Ukraine to negotiate when they arguably will soon have better capabilities than Russia in the short run? I think the key to the answer is in the short run, but I'd let you let you answer that one. Yeah, that's exactly the problem. Even if uh, in the short term, Ukraine has better weapons, it tends to be running out of military personnel to use those weapons. And that's not going to get better. That will get worse with the passage of every week, month, and year. Um, Russia's advantages, its material advantages in terms of both population and uh, weapons manufacturing will play a larger and larger role. Ukraine has been surprisingly successful so far, but as I said earlier, I think a lot of that is due to the intelligence information and guidance that the United States and other NATO powers have been providing. It really can't get much better than that. There's not any room for uh, a significant increase in that uh, level of assistance. So I, again, emphasize this is probably the high water mark of Ukraine's military success. And much as if you have a stock that has had a tremendous run, looks greatly overvalued. You better sell it. You better not hang on to it and 
stick with it all the way down to uh, what is likely to be a, a very low level. That's the situation the United States and NATO face now with respect to Ukraine. Before uh, I pass it on to Sean, there's a, there's a very good question that just came and it's kind of tied to my last question to you. Um, um, no one likes deterministic predictions and I'm, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna ask you to make any kind of like, you know, fixed timeline or something <clears throat> like that. But uh, the question that uh, is asked here is, um, if China fears sanctions as it should, and if Ukraine gets F-16s, how will this end? Now, before you answer that question, I'm going to add to my my two cents to that. First of all, there's a lot, you know, as the Spartans once said, um, everything, you know, uh, starts with that if. Um, but um, if I were to ask you to visualize the next one, one and a half years with the growing US skepticism, public skepticism towards the war, with the constant leaks from the national security state, with absolute uh, fracture that's happening within the NATO, how would you think where would we stand, where we are standing in the next uh, year, year and a half, and how should we end this while we are where we are? Well, I hope the uh, war in Ukraine comes to an end long before a year, year and a half, but uh, given the stubborn nature of uh, policymakers on all sides, uh, this could go on for uh, even more than a year, year and a half. The United States uh, threats against China, if China dares send weapons to Russia, those threats are a bit hollow. Um, a rapid decoupling of the U.S. economy from China economy would be quite devastating. In addition, um, whether we like it or not, China is one of America's most important bankers in terms of the government debt that it holds and its willingness to purchase additional U.S. government debt. If China pulls out of that market, uh, the co economic consequences to the United States will be quite unpleasant indeed. So the Biden administration has to treat relations with China with kid gloves. They can't just uh, decide on a brawl because China might supply some weapons to Russia. For their part, the Chinese, I think, are going to be very cautious on that, too. And what they're doing is, I believe, sending a message to the United States and its allies, dial back your aid to Ukraine so that we can get this war settled. If you don't, we may be compelled to offset your assistance to Ukraine by giving assistance, military hardware to Russia to keep Russia in the international system as a relevant major player. That's the situation now. And I think US leaders would be wise to heed that implicit warning. The best thing that can happen is to bring this unpleasant bloodbath to an end as soon as possible. Uh, we don't really have much time, but um, there are three quick questions just came up. So I'm just gonna ask very quick answers from, uh, from you. Uh, the first question is very interesting. Apart from NATO expansion, what else, if anything, has the United States done that has contributed to the outbreak of the war? I can think of one, but I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell, you know, tell that after you answer the question. Uh, the second question is, uh, isn't the Ukraine war uh, kind of retribution against Russia uh, because Russia supported Syria during the Obama administration? And the final question is, what is the fundamental interest of US belligerents with Russia? So uh, if you can briefly answer all three questions, I know there's not much of a time, but yeah. All right, first of all, the in addition to NATO expansion, uh, the US and NATO meddling in the Balkans going after longstanding uh, Russian clients in, in that region. Uh, and the just before the Ukraine war, the elimination of major arms control agreements that Russia regarded as important. So I think those were very significant factors as well. The 
I don't want to see the war turn into this kind of morality play. Russia is not justified in what it did in Ukraine. But again, the United States and its allies contributed to this crisis as well. We're not going to achieve the broader objective of taking Russia out as a, as a credible peer rival. Uh, again, that objective, I think, has to be abandoned. Russia is not going to succeed in turning Ukraine into a puppet state. And if that was Putin's goal, that clearly has failed. So there is a basis here of mutual disappointment, if you will, for a possible settlement. Right. And the final question is, is there any U.S. interest in belligerence with Russia currently? Well, pursuing this half-pregnant belligerency status uh, is dangerous, extremely right. dangerous. We're antagonizing a country with over 6,000 nuclear weapons. That's not wise. And there's certainly nothing at stake in terms of genuine American interests in Ukraine that warrant taking that level of risk. Thank you, Dr. Carpenter. It was a, a great discussion. I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Dr. Sean Riley, and he's going to take it forward from there. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. All right, and thank you both. Thanks to all of our attendees. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Uh, once again, I want to remind you, please do consider subscribing to the magazine uh, and check out our website where we publish content daily uh, for your consideration. And uh, please look be on the lookout for future events. Pleasure to have you. Thanks so much.